Welcome to the Garrity Talks. My name is Lucy Ongai and I am the co-founder of Garrity Awards. We are going to chat today about futurism, among other things, with our two guests. We have today Alice Gripa, who is a true believer in the power of creativity to build, build a better future. And after winning awards at Leo Burnett Milan and FCB Chicago, she's now one of the creative futurists at Zeus Jones actively partnering with companies focused on building today the best possible tomorrow and a lecturing professor at Polytechnic University of Milan, where she explores the creative partnership between AI and creatives. Welcome, Alice, and thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure, a wonderful description, thank you. <laughs> and we have also Victoria Osayantin Oshodin, she is a British award-winning hybrid creative director, producer, and founder of Creative Victory, a dedicated philanthropist who is driving for change in industry and organizations to authentically embrace individuals from all walks of life. Thanks for joining us, Victoria. Thank you for having me. So welcome uh, for joining us today. And uh, so Alice, you are a creative futurist at Suez Jones and an award-winning creative director at the top of your field. Can you please tell us more about your role and your company? Yes. Yeah, so first of all, when I started, I really did not know what a creative futurist was. But it sounded so exciting. And of course, they try. And along the way, I just realized that I have been working in that capacity for much longer than, you know, starting this new position. Just my title wasn't reflecting that as much. So as I said, being a creative in general is really like imagining something so vividly that people can really start believe is possible that happens. And at some point you really help them make it happen. So a future is does exactly the same. The only difference to me is that I used to work on projects that were really around the corner. Like imagine a product launch, a messaging campaign is you yesterday is always that philosophy. A futurist works typically on a scenario that maybe is like five years from now, maybe it's 10, or the most interesting one are really 30 years from now. So it's the same kind of mindset. It just apply with different tools much ahead. And as you said, I work at Zeus Jones. It's the first time I'm part of a B Corp company. I used to work in traditional multinational company. So it's very interesting because I really see how everybody use their creativity, their strategic mindset, all the data foresight that you can possibly gather, really with that idea of making business a force of good. And I don't, I don't say lightly. It really means like building that future where not just, you know, our clients can thrive, but, you know, all the surrounding reality around them can thrive. And that's to me is very exciting. I, I yeah, I have a hard time thinking about 30 years ahead from now. So <laughs> I can imagine that must be hard for you too. <laughs> It's fun though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, Victoria, you're uh, um, a British award winning hybrid creative director, producer, and founder of Creative Victory. Can you tell us too about your role and Victory? Yeah, most definitely. So I'm currently working at um, as a creative director at the UniWorld Group. Um, it's a full service advertising agency and it is the longest standing multicultural ad agency in the US. Um, so I moved over to the US in 2020. Prior to that, I was working within my company, Creative Victory, which in a nutshell, this basically means my, my Victoria, Victoria's story. So basically what I did with, uh, with that agency, so initially I started off as a runner, worked my way up, and then I um, started realizing and just learning from people, from producers that have been in the game for years and creatives, um, and I realized that you don't have to be one person or one thing. And um, so I, I, I'm a big believer in, learner, uh, in learning. So um, I took those skills and uh, then took um, other skills in, when it comes to like, you know, editing um, and designing and then decided to start my own company. And I thought it, because a lot of people always said to me, you know, you have to be one thing, you have to be a producer, you have to be a, a creative, you have to be this, you have to be that. And I realized you actually don't, you can be whatever it is that you want to be. So um, I took that thought that my parents um, installed in me and then um, opened Creative Victory and started working with 
other companies like BBC Studio, CPNB, and a few other companies and agencies. And what I realized was a lot of these agencies and companies and broadcast companies, they were very open to having individuals like me because it helped like connect things together. Um, and in a, in, a, in a nutshell, it was quite futuristic in a sense of not having to be one person or have one role. Uh, um, so with Creative Victory, what I basically did was went around with different agencies, different companies, worked on campaigns to better serve them. Um, so yeah, basically that's what Creative Victory basically is, is uh, it's my story, is me um, helping to better serve agencies and companies. Obviously I am now at Uni World Group, which is very different for me because it's you know multicultural. It's something I've never necessarily had opportunity to do. So I'm learning you know, what it looks like to target a certain demographic um, based on you know, color and stuff like that. So um, I'm learning so much there and it's realizing even for my own self is that not, you know, when, you come to, when it comes to, to race, we're all not the same. So I'm learning so much and being, understanding what that future looks like. So um, that's Creative Victory in a nutshell on the side, but at the same time here, coming at Uni World Group, learning so much from amazing people. Cool, and uh, I read the following an article called The Future of Marketing Lies with the Futures, Futurists. To stay ahead of the technology curve and better anticipate consumer behavior, marketers can look to the work of futurists and become one themselves. Do you agree with this statement? I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in your everyday life, if you are not a futurist, what are you? Like a today is? A yesterday's, a maybe one day is. <laughs> I generally think like today calls so much for futurists, like the massive health, mental health crisis that we are living calls for futurists. You know, the weather calls for futurists. Everything around us calls for futurists. So that's why I feel like we all should learn these skills. And at the same time, of course, you know, recognize that there are people they maybe have, you know, sharper tools and so ask for help and, you know, do this journey together. I generally feel like we need to find a way to thrive in a way that, you know, apply to us, but without damaging anything around us. If anything, like nourishing the ecosystem and the society around us, like this cannot just keep going the way it is. So to me, a future is really seeing that possibility or working very hard to see it and then making it happen. So technology, I feel like, of course it can unlock big things, but to me it's not the point. It's a tool and of course it needs to be evaluated very carefully, but at the same time is the human, is the idea of future and life that we want that is really at the core of the work of a futurist. I totally agree. And I'm so happy you said that because, you know, I think technology definitely does help, but it can hinder if it's not done properly. Um, you know, I think, you you know, everyone's a futurist. Like you said, are you living yesterday-ist or tomorrow-ist or whatever, not tomorrow, it's got something to your future. But that being said, just be observant, be present, look at the world around you. Um, and I think, Personally, for me, what I'm noticing a lot in advertising is technology seems to be key and, and number one. And what you find is you're, on, you're not unlocking anything that's that positive because you're making individuals, you know, you're targeting individuals thinking this is what they want. This is what they need. This, but you don't know that. I don't, I don't personally feel like data necessarily explains everything. I feel then you, you take away people's opportunity to learn, to observe. Um, and I think it's quite dangerous to be quite frank. And what things would you pay attention to? Uh, you, you both mentioned technology, like not the only thing or maybe not the most important one, but what things do you, do you pay attention to your, in your daily life to, 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 to be a futuristic? For me personally, I just speak to people, you know, go online, see what people are doing. Um, and even online, you have to be quite careful, but, you know, what, see what people are listening to, what people care about. Um, you know, look at things that people, just, just be quite diverse in your search as well. And just be present, like I said, it's like being present, you know, like, you know, we just spoke about the weather, like, feel the weather, look at the weather, look at the trees, look at, you know, speak to people, 
listen to music, understand what people are consuming. You know, is it positive? Is it negative? What could you do to make it more positive? So yeah, I would personally say it's like literally being present to nature and being present to humans. Yeah, for me is actually very similar. So I, I like what you said, even the connection with nature. As Zeus Jones, we have a tool that the first time they take me through and I participated in using it, for me, it felt like Christmas. It was the best day ever in my career. <laughs> it felt so fun. And it's basically, you know, really analyzing a lot of, you know, the direction, kind of the signals that, you know, not just us, like any trend reporting agency come up with, but then kind of condensing them all in one tool and really seeing that there are many forces active, like demographics, economics, like health, the planet, energy, like there are so many. And at the same time, really trying to be observing in those forces and then you know the creativity comes in when you start to collide them so you take one like demographics for example you merge it with science and it's like okay i see these two things how can they evolve in five years in 30 years and of course you know when you are closer to that date you have already subject matter experts they are seeing that because they are working on it every day and then at, after a certain time there is the creative leap that you can take and you know it's just a hypothesis like the good and bad thing is that nobody knows it's really just ahead but you know imagining all these possible future and again not one many it really helps you understand it really helps you see a trajectory and how close that might be to what we were saying about is that what people are searching for example is that where people are craving so much therefore having this behavior they are or servable online and kind of you know start to see this pattern this start to see that trajectory and ask yourself so what can i do to make it happen if that's interesting what can i do to make it happen and what value do futurists bring to companies and brands in your opinion yeah to me like we we i think we are touching on this future is not easy might be fun might be exciting for a moment but it really takes a lot of energy and i would say also rigor commitment and you know a lot of hard things so nobody can really build the future by themselves and and so like it might take you know two people to tango but it takes many more people to evolve and you need to do it together there cannot just be a person running ahead and deciding what the future is going to look like you need to bring people along so i feel like what futurists do is really doing that process i feel like a lot of my work is really looking at what clients are already doing and kind of reframing what they are doing, just basically looking at one step higher and just seeing what they are struggling with or they are so passionate about what is the trajectory in the future that they are trying to draw. Maybe other people are not seeing it. And mm -hmm. when you do that, when you create that unlock, immediately you start to see the other people get excited. Maybe they get more traction internally, they get more funding. And that, you know, acceleration towards the future start to happen. So I feel the, the value that a futurist brings to a company sometimes is truly be observing and helping them kind of package all the energy, all the intuition they are really putting into the work, into a line, into a concept that everybody can be like, yes, I like that future. Let's do it. How can I help you? What do you need? Tell me and we will do it. And that's a beautiful unlock when it happens. I totally agree. I definitely agree on that. I don't think I need to really say too much on what you just said, but I also personally, you know, agree with what you said. And we bring new ways of working, new ways of learning. Um, we also think outside of the box. And that is a job, right? Our job is to think outside the box, is to think to the future, is to anticipate what could or may happen. It is to, it's, you know, it's, we bring just different ways of working, different ways of thinking. And, you know, we, it, it can't be done on our own. It, 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 can, it cannot be. But if you are this one person in the company that thinks that way, you have the ability to unlock 
ways of thinking, unlock ways of learning, unlock ways of visualizing things. Um, so I believe we bring <laughs> we bring the future. <laughs> In any case, you both mentioned about observing and being and paying attention to everything that is happening around us. So I guess that's a, that's a big key and, and maybe we get lost with everything that is happening around in the world these days. <laughs> and uh, Alice, your profile reads as visiting professor at Milan's Politecnico, I researched to redesign the rules of brainstorming. So can you tell us more about this redesigning the rules of brainstorming or alternative brainstorming methods? I'm very curious about this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So at least in my experience, being creative really starts with being vulnerable. And, you know, we can all discuss if that's true in your experience or not. But sometimes, you know, in the creative process, there is pain, it's harsh, it's ruthless. Your idea, your baby idea dies. I mean, it's not simple. Or people might, you know, react very badly to something that you thought was funny or interesting or very challenging. So if that's us, the interior, we are professionally trained to do that every given day. Imagine a person that is not trained to do that. Maybe a person that grew up saying like, I don't do creative. No, no, no. I'm a realist. I, I work with the, the real stuff that is around us. Like these people, if you ask them like, so how do you imagine the future? What do you want to possibly have that you never think of or you never could have in your reality? What is that? They won't say anything or they will go very little or it's just not they, op they operate. Their entire life is based on reality and being efficient, being effective. So what I observed is that you need basically to build a common ground. You need to build a common language for creative people. They enjoy doing that and being a little crazy and people who absolutely <laughs> are not into that. And that happens when literally nobody has the answer. And I found that in improv. I studied that a little bit in Second City in Chicago, where I spent a number of years. And there are games, there are situations where literally nobody has the answer. So it goes back to being the futurist. Nobody has the answer for the future. And in that moment, the only thing a creative or non-creative can do is, you know, think with their gut, say the first thing they have in their mind, and really own it, run with it, just explore where it takes you, like it was a train, like it was, you know, a path to somewhere, and just have fun with that. So when they start to see that nobody is so great at this, and it's just a lot of fun, then they start to really tap into their imagination and their creativity, even when they don't have creative in a title and when they never did it before. And, you know, I honestly have come to not a conclusion but at least the impression that yes creative are awesome and they have a big role in this industry i'm not declining that but there is no creative that can match what a, you know a subject matter expert a person with decades of experience in a field knows and can imagine just because they spend so much time thinking about this problem living in that reality and so i think our role as a creative is unlock that imagination letting them feel they they allow themselves to imagine those things and when those things come out then use our skill to make them happy to make them round to make them believable and you know viable viable so that's what i do a little bit with my students in my classes <laughs> and you also studied some comedy writing how does this help you with your tasks well, that it didn't help much because oh. it was too close to to what I do, you know, in our, my regular life. So I definitely did not know how to let go and just go with the flow. So that was my signal for doing actual improv, more performative. And that for me was, of course, a massive failure. But at the same time, it taught me that, that sometimes, you know, you get too much in your head. And that's why you need really the body, the energy, the, the performance in the moment to just kind of jump to a conclusion that you will never allow yourself to do with your rational brain so that kind of weird setup like role playing stuff that you might not see as necessary I felt it is because it's really where you find that gap that leap that takes you somewhere you could never imagine you could go 
Mm. And uh, Victoria, you graduated in acting studies. So we have a uh, comedy acting. We have everything today <laughs> <laughs> at the University of Manchester, Kingston <laughs> College and the National Youth Theatre before entering the field of advertising. How did your acting studies help you with, uh, with your change? It helped a lot, to be honest, um, because I'm a method actress um, trained in Stanislavski. And if anyone's not really too sure what that is, it's basically, obviously, it's designed for actors to create believable characters and become, you know, that character. So you, you put yourself in that place of the character. So when I work in the creative field, I do the same thing. I take my time and look at, you know, the, the brief, who's my demographic, who my region. A lot of it has been global campaigns, so I'm clearly not every single person in every demographic. But what I have done and been, um, I would say, privileged to, to have is being able to travel at a young age. And when I travel, it goes back to what I was saying previously, I, I'm present in these places. I speak to people. I take on their culture. I ask questions. Um, for things that I don't know and don't understand, Google is obviously amazing, YouTube. Um, and doing your own research, right? So what I then do is take aspects of my life and kind of connect it. It sounds really weird. So you just become that person, you become all these people. And then when you become all these individuals, obviously at times I can't be everyone, but if I can't connect to a person based on a visual, I'll use the music. I will use it. So I'll use that whenever I can to necessarily connect to you know certain demographics within a campaign. Um, so what it taught me and what why it helped me so much is because it allowed me to put myself in these in these in these spots and be these individuals. So if you are these individuals, even if it's slightly five percent, you're targeting them, but in an authentic way, rather than assuming this is what they do, assuming this is what they may mm. like, assuming whatever, you then are them for five percent, right? And that feels to me anyway that's perfect tar um, marketing because. It's targeted, but targeted in an authentic way. You know, people can say this, you know, this demographic eats this way, this demographic thinks this way, this demographic does this and does that. You're not necessarily correct, right? And I will never always be correct on everything I do, but what I do do is try. And it goes back to, you know, what we were speaking about previously, what you just said about letting yourself go and create, creating, sorry. So by being these individuals, I'm able to create in their manner, and also being able to, you know, know when to draw the line. So I would say that my um, acting career helps helps a lot because it, it tells me to be present. It tells me to really understand what I'm seeing. So yeah. Hmm. And your bio says, "I see myself as a human scaffold. Scaffolds <laughs> enable individuals to move around safely in a direction needed to complete a task." Can you tell us more about this? I'm also very curious about your question, your answer, sorry. I love that. Of course, <laughs> <laughs> of course because, you know, this object is obviously crucial in providing a safe space and it protects, you know, individuals to move around safely. And it goes back again to what you're saying, like creatives, when we were younger, right, when we were kids, we don't have inhibition. So we're out here literally thinking we could be spider woman we could be anything that we want to be the older we get life cuts us down and tells us we can't be this we can't do that we can't do whatever as my role as a creative director is to give you that safe space to be crazy and think about something that doesn't seem possible but guess what it could be possible but it can't be possible if I don't give you a safe space to get to that place mm. so that is exactly what I mean when it comes to a human scaffold <laughs> <laughs> and what are the biggest challenges you face today in, in, in your job or in your daily work? Both of you. That's a question for the both of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, it's there's two things. One is sometimes, you know, clients not being as open to exploring new ways or, you know, they think this is the best way, then you have to try to explain to them this may not be the right way or whatever the case may be sometimes as clients I think that's all around and I think the biggest thing is myself and um, it goes back to that inhibition I was saying you know life will cut you down life will tell you you can't do this or you can't think this way or you, you, you can't do a lot of things I think especially after COVID it has really been self but mm -hmm. at the same time it's made me stronger and I'm learning to see who this new 
Victoria Asiyan and the Shonen is. So um, I would say self for now. You know, next week it could be something completely, or next year it could be something completely different. But I would say self because I, I'm my own go- um, gatekeeper. So I can do what I say I want to do. And if I say I can't do it, I won't get there. For me, I feel like I touched upon this a little bit earlier. For me, it's all about mental health. I think we have been through a bunch of epidemics, but the biggest one is still here. You know, I I see on myself and it's not fun. I see on my colleagues or my former colleagues. And honestly, it's kind of crushing when, again, I have my class, the Politecnico, and I see, I talk with, uh, you know, young talents mm. that they are starting and they're already experiencing things and symptoms and not fun situation that happened to me maybe after 10 years and they are already in that spot they haven't even started <laughs> really so wow. that's not a future I want to see for much longer of course it's none of their fault is I, I love what you said about the safe space it means that, you know, this industry that is so essential, so fascinating for many, is not a safe space. And I think we should just acknowledge that. So we need to work to make it a safe space and decide what that means for each individual, each company. But for example, in my class, um, one interesting topic that we are exploring that you mentioned earlier is the relationship between humans and AI. I, I really want to explore a little bit more. We all heard about, you know, DALI and all these amazing new application. Like, let's think for a second. What if a person, like, imagine a new creative, an art director or a filmmaker, a designer, now has not just a tool because I feel it's too small to think that way. Imagine that that AI is a person, is a teammate, is a person you can recruit for like you would do for a designer or for you know an art director or an illustrator so imagine now you have that person on your team that meets you every monday morning at nine what can you do how would you focus your energy as a human human creative now you have a super brain and a super photoshopper and a super whatever on your team that does that is not is a snap second and more important, like how much more risk can you take knowing that it won't take you a week to comp up something, but it might take two seconds. And, you know, even asking the wrong question, it will be a drama, actually might inspire you back because you ask for a dog on the moon, I don't know, eating ramen, and instead it spits you out something different that makes you think to this entire scene in a whole new way. So I'm doing these experiments and conversation to see if that's the start to really set the foundation for, you know, a life where you can have creativity, but you can have mental health in a good spot. And, you know, that work-life balance is not a privilege. It's something everybody can realistically think they will attain in their life. So we, we go now with the last question. So we are talking about the future. So what do you think would be the next big thing in the near future? I will start. So we, my colleague, uh, Zeus Jones, we have a wonderful project that is actually a new publication is coming up in the next couple of weeks. And we roll it out as Athena. It is basically a platform where we ask ourselves all the questions that nobody has time to ask. Nobody <laughs> has ever, you know, properly addressed. And the next question we are asking ourselves is something along the lines, what if choosing joy as your primary duty could make us more resilient? We all talk about resilience. And sometimes it just feels like another form of eternal grind, suffering, enduring through pain. And, you know, it just burns us down. That's just the reality. So for me, the next big thing in the future is starting to think an entire new paradigm. What if we elected joy and that, you know, exploration, that, you know, freedom, and that you just, you know, that pleasure that comes from that, kind of allowing ourselves to explore and just be attracted to things and follow that, you know, sentiment. What if we swap that for the pain, for the grind, for the suffering? How can we make 
a society, how can we make a, an advertising industry that is based on that, that can thrive on that? What do we have to change to make it happen? And, you know, we are interrogating ourselves on, on these topics and see what is already happening in other fields, in the art, in science. And, and so I'm really excited because I feel like I feel it for myself and it's connected to the previous question about mental health, that we mm. need to be in a place of joy. We need to you know, nourish ourselves in that way. And I think we probably are on the brink or really started to make positive change to allow that to re really happen at scale. That was really cool. I can't wait for that to be rolled out. Um, so yeah, honestly, what I want the future to look like and be, I'm not 100% sure it will be, especially when we're using things like data and personaliza personalization, you know, things like that, I really do think is quite harmful um, to a certain extent. Uh, and, and, you know, this, for the past few years, I've really noticed how much it has impacted us on the way that we create, the way mm. that we think. Um, and mental health is a big, big thing to me. And I think with data personalization, I think that can harm one's person, um, you know, mental health. Uh, what I would like the future to be is that individuals have a work-life balance, is individuals are able to actually create in an authentic way like they did years ago. You know, how many adverts, how many movies do you see nowadays when people say, this was amazing? and talk about it for months or years. You don't see that anymore because everything's so personalized. And it's mm -hmm. like at 0 0.5 seconds, something needs to blow up because that's when a human gets entertained. <laughs> Clearly not because, you know, but you know, things like that. But the, yeah, <laughs> you know, and it's like, how many, you know, how many people even go to the cinema as much anymore? And that's because, again, going back to that technology, it serves as a, in a positive way at times, but it can be very negative. And that, again, plays on our mental health. Um, so what I want is that future, what I feel may happen, because you're already seeing it, is these data, um, data personalizations. It is um, it's a world where, unfortunately, where uh, creators may not be needed anymore. You know, that's what I feel, you know, um, if we continue to go the route that we're going. But if we have more individuals like ourselves, that are talking about, you know, no, there needs to be a balance. I believe it will go the way that clearly we want it to go, which is a balance of mental health, realization, being present, and allowing technology to be a useful tool. Okay, well, let's hope for a real good future then. I hope uh, I have many good projects coming along. And thank you so much for joining us today for this Garrity Talk about Futurism. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you so much.